How's it going, and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on Curse of Strahd, a 5th edition module. In today's video, we will be diving into the Wizard of Wines winery, say that five times fast. We're going to be going over what the location's like, how to get your players there, and what happens if certain events unfold. Of course, there's going to be a ton of spoilers, so players that plan on playing in this adventure do not watch this. But DMs that want added insight on how we can run this thing, let's go ahead and dive right in. And here we are, the Wizard of Wines Winery. A pretty simple location, a nice two-story dwelling with a little basement here, and of course, there is a lot of information packed in here. But while this place is unique and interesting, the question is, why would players go out of the way to come here? Well, the real simple solution is, there is a wine shortage in Barovia. People are running out of wine, and there's only one place it really comes from, the Wizard of Wines Winery. While it does state in the text that the Vistani do in fact bring wine out from the lands outside of Barovia, they rarely do give it out to the people of the land. It would make far more sense that things be domestic, and that is what this place is for. But you see, lately there's been an issue with the winery. Some druids came around and jacked up the place, are now occupying it, and stolen magical gems that enable the wine to grow. In the intro to the Wizard of Wines winery here, we get some really solid information about what's going on. This winery is very old. It was created by a mage whose name has been lost in time, and it is being ran now by the Martikovs, a family that has owned this place for generations. At some point down the line, the Martikov family got infected with lycanthropy and are all now were-ravens. Mind you, being a were-raven doesn't inherently turn you evil, so that's good. The Were Ravens provide the wine to Barovian taverns for free, knowing the good it brings to the Barovian people. And that is true. Wine is the lifeblood of the people of Barovia. Their lives are so terrible and miserable. At least if they can drink, they have some sort of happiness. If they lose that, then they're all sober and miserable. You know, life's gonna suck. The winery is known for three wines, the unremarkable purple grape mash number three, the slightly more tantalizing red dragon crush, and the rich champagne du l'estamp. Ten years ago, one of three magical gems was stolen, and that was the champagne du l'estamp gem. So for ten whole years, there's been no more champagne in the lands of Barovia. And this event prompts Davian Martikov to blame his son Erwin for this cause because Erwin was on watch during that time, and under his watch, the gem got stolen. Erwin, of course, is the tavern owner at the Blue Water Inn in Velaki. Three weeks ago, during an attack, another gem was found, dug up and taken by Baba La Saga's Scarecrow army. Baba La Saga took this gem and implanted it into a tree, which she now uses as a creeping hut. Pretty awesome. And then, five days ago, Evil Druid stole the third and final gem and bore it to Yestra Hill. The Were Ravens launched a counterattack on the hill, but were beaten back, and now, unfortunately, there is no more gems, and thus no more wine production. Two days ago, the Druids returned with a horde of blights and drove Davian's family out from the winery, and are now poisoning the wine and occupying the place, and that is where your players come into play. So this is something I harp on regularly in this campaign, and I will for all campaigns, is time. Is it believable that your players are showing up right after all these events go down? Or your players just simply find themselves moving along this calendar of events, and whether they're there or not, they happen. Because of course, if you are having it where the calendar is going on whether they like it or not, then you have to keep into consideration, okay, it's been four days since they arrived in the lands of Barovia, and, you know, what happens after that? Maybe they spend a whole ten days in town doing absolutely nothing, and outside in the world, things are shaking up. You are going to have to consider if time is a ramification in your game or not. For approaching the vineyard, we get some really good information here on all of the members of the Martikov family that reside here. We actually get names, which is surprising considering there's a lot of named NPCs here. Davian is going to tell the party that some druids have taken up residence in their place and he needs some help to drive them away. He's not going to tell them about the magical seeds until he sizes up if they are good guys or not. Because, of course, your players might not be on the up and up. Your players may be people that go ahead and steal magical gems and sell them off or use them to their own devices or whatever the case may be. So they are going to size up the players to make sure that they are good. If they are good, then after the place is cleared out, Davian's going to confide in them and say, Hey, 
There is some magical gems, and if we do not retrieve any of these gems, no more wine in the lands of Barovia. So after your players either talk to the Martikovs or they just decide to go ahead and storm the castle, that is when the bad stuff's going to go down. When the characters reach the winery, they are going to be beset upon by a whole bunch of needle blights. 30 needle blights in six groups of five are going to spring up from the ground and go ahead and attack the party. So as it's written, it's supposed to imply that as these things are raising up, your players should be smart enough to go ahead and dive right into the winery and then go ahead and board themselves up so they don't have to worry about the horde of monsters behind them. But you see, the thing is, is that we're playing D&D and players never do what you want them to do. Sometimes you might have a group of people that says, okay, we'll just go ahead and stay outside and fight. In which case, that is a possibility. If your players go ahead and stay outside and fight, they're going to go ahead and fight all the Needle Blights outside. And then three rounds later, some reinforcements show up. And then four rounds later, some more reinforcements show up. And then on the fifth round, some more reinforcements are going to show up from inside of the winery. So this is a huge issue if you are running this for a lower level group. If you are running a level 3 group, just fighting outside and they're completely surrounded, they can't maneuver at all because they're completely surrounded, that is going to be really bad. All those attacks are going to add up. They are going to then be attacked by druids who are going to be doing a whole bunch of terrible stuff. And it's not going to be pretty. So if you are running a lower level group, you really need to incentivize them that they need to make their way inside of the winery so they don't have to deal with the massive horde. If you are running a higher level party, if they are, let's say, 5th level, 6th level, heck, if they are 7th level, then they probably don't need to worry about only 30 little Needle Blights here. So as we can see by the stats of the Needle Blights, they are individually okay-ish. They've got 11 HP, so... Every once in a while, if you hit them with a melee attack, they don't die. But, like I said, if you're running a higher level group, they're going to be just destroying them left, right, and center. These things, if they are attacking AC hogs, they're not going to be hitting that often. And, of course, if you got that wizard that casts fireball, then it's going to kill a whole bunch of them. So, how do we telegraph to our players that they need to make their way inside of the winery if you want that to be the case? Well, I think that 30 is actually not a big enough incentive if you are running a, you know, let's say level 3 to level 4 group, I think 30 is just too small of a number. If you go ahead and describe it as dozens and dozens, maybe even close to 100 of these needle blights, these humanoid looking tree creatures rising up from the ground and slowly start shambling to them, that should hopefully drive them into the winery, in which case they'll have enough time to board themselves up. But if you go ahead and just say, oh yeah, it's just 30, then some people might get the impression that, oh, this is a winnable fight and go ahead and take it. The number of needle blights that they have outside really shouldn't matter. It really should come down to the fact that your players, if they are creative enough, can go ahead and make their way into the winery, kill all of the druids, and then decide if they want to destroy all of the needle blights at once, or if they want to go ahead and get down and dirty and do it manually. Now, how are they going to destroy all of these blights at once? Well, you see, there's a druid that is lurking inside of the winery that has a staff called the Gulthia staff. Look at this thing. This thing looks gnarly. It's pretty dope. In fact, actually, when I was a player, I got to wield this thing for a bit of time. It was pretty cool. This staff operates as a magical quarterstaff. When you hit someone, you can go ahead and expend one of his charges to regain a number of hit points equal to the damage dealt by the weapon. Each time a charge is spent in this way, Red blood oozes from the staff's pores, and you must succeed on a DC 12 wisdom saving throw or be afflicted by short-term madness. That is insanely crippling. There is a lot of effects here on the short-term madness table, which can absolutely cripple someone out of combat. If they get stunned, if they fall unconscious, if they retreat and become paralyzed, all of these things are insanely bad. So, if someone actually recognizes the bad things that can come out of the staff, then... They may not be incentivized to do that often, but if they have a high wisdom saving throw, or if they're feeling really desperate, then they might go ahead and use it. But, the real kicker about the Gulthia staff here is, if the staff is broken or burned to ashes, its wood releases a terrible inhuman scream that can be heard from a range out to a 300 feet. All blights that can hear this scream immediately wither and die. So, you see, it doesn't matter if there is only 30 or if there's hundreds outside, if your players destroy this staff, then they could go ahead and just go ahead and kill every single one of them. 
But you see, creative players might go ahead and decide to do this manually because, one, this is a magical weapon, and depending on how lucky or unlucky your players are, they may not get magical weapons in this campaign. And having this one, especially if it's the first one, they might want to latch onto it. The second thing here is Blightbane. While you are attuned to the staff, Blights and other evil plant creatures don't regard you as hostile until you harm them. So, as we can infer here, that means that whoever wields the thing can just go ahead and step outside and then doesn't have to worry about the army of Blights outside. So I've seen a lot of people defer on what the Blight Beaming effect actually entails a wielder to do. It states here that a creature doesn't regard you as hostile unless you harm them. So what does harming actually mean? Are you allowed to go ahead and just grab one of these creatures and chuck it in the fire? And by the time it gets out of the fire, it's too late? But the more important aspect here is, are you allowed to go ahead and attack individual blight creatures? If this is the case, where anybody attuned to this thing can go ahead and attack any one creature, and then all the others don't attack them immediately, that does mean that if someone is willing to take the time, they could go ahead and holding the staff, go ahead and beat up every single one of the blights one by one. But if you are referring it to as if just in a general area, if you're being hostile to them, then they all go ahead and pull aggro on you. Then, of course, that plan isn't going to work. I personally can't recommend any one way or the other. I do, however, like the idea of being creative in this. I like the idea that whoever takes the staff can go ahead and just start marching around and killing all the blights one by one, or maybe pushing them into a pit, or, you know, just doing something creative here. Because, like I said, magical weapons are not that prevalent in this campaign. If your players don't search every nook and cranny of the entire world, it is very likely that the Golthia Staff could be one of the first and maybe even only magical items they really come across. That isn't, of course, one of the fabled treasures. So now that we've covered how to get your players inside of the winery, let's go ahead and dive into all the locations of said winery. In Area 1, we have the stables. The Martikovs keep two draft horses here, and unfortunately they didn't pull them out in time before the druids took over the place. So, I'm actually curious, what would the druids do with these two horses? You know, druids by nature are, you know, inclined to like nature, and typically like beast of the land. But, do these druids in particular like horses? I would say that the druids wouldn't be dicks and kill these horses, but... Hey, maybe they like some good meat. Who knows? Something to consider, once again, if you're running this on a long time location here. If your players don't go ahead and storm the castle, maybe the druids, as they're sieging this place out, go ahead and start eating the horses. You know, you can be a little bit macabre with this. And I'm willing to bet that if you tell your players that those druids killed the horses, that is going to drive them to kill all these terrible people. In area 2 we have the loading dock, because yes, if you have wine barrels, they're freaking heavy, and there's pretty much no way you can hand those things. So it makes sense that there'd be a cart that pulls up, and you can go ahead and start rolling some wine barrels onto it. Bada bing bada boom, it's done. In areas 3 and 4 we have the barrel maker's workshop and the barrel storage. Pretty simple stuff here. But the thing is, is this is more than likely going to be one of the locations which your players dive into, especially if they are beset upon by hundreds of twig blights. So depending on how your players combat this encounter, this might be a little base of operations here, as they go ahead and board up the doors and make sure that no one's coming around to get them. In particular, the reason why Area 4 is important is because there is two doors leading out, but more importantly, there is a staircase that leads to the second floor. In Area 5, we have the veranda. This is the location that the grapes are turned into juice here. And there is some doors here, but interesting note is that breaking through either of those doors is going to require a DC 20 strength check, which is going to be hard for a lot of people. But hopefully they either go ahead and bust through, or they decided to go around and try any of the other doors. In Area 6 and 7, we have the well and the outhouse. The well doesn't have really anything too fancy going on with it. And Area 7, it specifically states the outhouse contains no surprises. The surprising aspect of this is the fact that there is an outhouse, because if you look at the majority of D&D modules, most places don't have bathrooms, so it is a pleasant surprise to see that, I guess. In Area 8, storage, this is basically just a coat room that people would go ahead and put all their stuff up in. 
The Martikovs were able to grab a few things before making their way out of here, but unfortunately didn't get everything that they wanted. But thankfully, your players can go ahead and use this to try and sneak into the side. In Area 9, the Fermentation Vats, there is a ton of info dump here, and specifically a lot of exposition dump that you give to your players here. And once again, this plays into the time aspect of your game. This text right here, the Balcony Kriegs drawing your eye to a wild looking figure haunched over, pouring some poison. You would go ahead and do this if you're running a game where your players show up right at the right time and see everything for their own self. But realistically, the druids would have already done this long before your players got here, and it doesn't make any sense really. So play that up to your own campaign. If you are running a game where they're big damn heroes see everything, great, that's awesome, run it. But if you're running a game where a lot of things happen off screen, then go ahead and as they walk in, you should describe to them that there's a nasty looking ichor that's draped all about the vats of wine and it smells pungent. It doesn't smell like actual wine. Now it smells like poison. So here's another important aspect of this location. Your players walk in, they will be able to see the druids that are hanging around here. But more importantly, there is 24 twig blights that are all held up in one of these vats. So if your players get into a combat here, the druid's going to go ahead and shout out some command, and all of the twig blights are going to go ahead and start scattering out. But thankfully, twig blights individually are not that strong. But what helps out in this combat scenario is a swarm of ravens. The four swarms of ravens descend from the rafters and begin attacking the blights. Each swarm tears apart one twig blight on each of its turns. So if your players don't impact the combat at all whatsoever, between the four swarms of ravens, they'll be able to knock out all the twig blights in six rounds. So there's two things I want to talk about in this room in particular. It is one, there is a bunch of connecting doors here. We can see that there is a bejesus ton of doors that all connect to various different locations. And your players, if they're snooping around and being stealthy about it, could potentially move around in a such a fashion that they disturb the druids and maybe get the drop on them. So you have to consider the whole exploration aspect of this location but you need to consider the verticality of this map. Unfortunately, if you're playing in a 2D realm here, like on a virtual tabletop, it's gonna be kind of hard to present that, hey, you know, when you walk in, this is also what you can see. And important in particular is you need to go ahead and tell them that behind the staircase, specifically on the map of this location here, that underneath the dotted line, all check it around to this location is in fact underneath the second floor. In Area 10, we have the Glass Blowers Workshop, and you'll never guess what they do here. They make the bottles, and then they go ahead and fill them up. The interesting thing about this location is two things. One, there's a staircase that leads down to the cellar, but two, and more importantly, if your players have been told that this is one of the fortunes of Ravenloft can be found in here, then it is located right in here. It is buried in the barrel of sand. Emptying this thing or digging through the sand reveals the treasure without the need for a check. Areas 11 and 12, the spiral staircase and the ramp, are locations which can take you both upstairs and downstairs all around, so those are very useful for the verticality of this location. In area 13 and 14, we have the back staircase and the wine cellar. So 13, it just takes you right down to the stairs, not big of a deal. In area 14, though, we have the wine cellar, and when your players arrive in here, they'll be able to see this place all about, but if they have not caused a commotion, then they're going to find a druid and some needle blights down here. And what's interesting about this location, and something I want to see in a lot more locations, especially for newer DMs, is battle tactics. It states here, on the first turn, from behind the wine rack, the druid casts Thunder Wave, which shatters 1d20 plus 10 wine bottles as it resounds through the cellar. The druid then orders the needle blights to attack. You know, I like that stuff. It's good for both new and veteran DMs because it gives you a sense of what they would actually do and, you know, makes you not have to think as much. In Area 15, we have Brown Mold. So your players, as they're searching around the wine cellar here, might discover that it gets really, really cold in here. And if they go ahead and start snooping around the place, specifically making perception checks to feel up on the wall to see if there's any hidden doors, they can, in fact, actually find the hidden door right there in the center. If they go ahead and open it, they can see inside, and if they make their way inside, they are going to be assaulted by brown mold. Brown mold is actually very terrifying. A patch of brown mold typically covers a 10 foot square, and the temperature within 30 feet of it is always frigid. When a creature moves to within 5 feet of the mold for the first time on a turn, it must make a DC 12 constitution saving throw, or take 4d10 points of cold damage on a failed save, or have as much on a success. 
This is really scary. If you have a lower level group, 4d10 points of damage, especially after they've gotten into a fight with some druids, could theoretically kill them. So hopefully you don't have people that are too inquisitive. Hopefully you have some higher level people. And hopefully if they open up the door and know for a fact it's cold in there, they don't go ahead and step into the cold. Now moving on to the second floor, area 16 of the loading winch, we find here a druid who is babbling. This guy is crazy, and if your players make their way in here, this guy will only fight if he is cornered. Otherwise, he tries to flee by dropping into the wagon in the loading dock. He then looks for a place in the winery to hide. The characters who understand the druidic babbling know that he is saying, Nature bows to my every whim, for I have the vampire staff. So if you have someone that can translate that, then that's kind of a big deal. Because then they'll know, hey, we want that stuff. But if they don't understand what he's saying, he's just going to sound like a crazy person. So I would encourage you, if your players do come in here, that you should go ahead and pay closer attention to detail about that staff. Go ahead and tell them that all the other druids have been using some sort of druidic focus, whether that be a totem or a staff or some gnarled wand or whatever. But this guy in particular, his staff is literally brimming with pure evil and awesomeness. Now, once again, a little bit odd, it states here that this guy tries to hide in the winery. It would make more sense if this guy was to go ahead and drop down and then run away from the winery because he can go ahead and just run through the crowd of twig blights, no issue. So I would go ahead and personally move this druid in particular to somewhere where it wouldn't make sense for him to be able to run away to. Maybe go ahead and move him to one of the bedrooms located to the left here. Or, you know, maybe just have him on the front floor right when your players go ahead and enter. Area 17, the master bedroom. It's a master bedroom. It's well furnished, well nice. There's a whole bunch of great information dump here. And there's a ton of treasure. But the thing is, is if your people are heroes that are awesome and not scumbags, then they should know not to touch anything. And they should know that they're coming here to liberate this place, not abscond with whatever they can get. So if the players came here alone to this house, then maybe they can go ahead and try and steal some stuff. But maybe you go ahead and say that one of the Martikovs, maybe not Davian himself, but maybe one of his sons, goes ahead and joins the party as they go ahead and raid this place. And if they have one of the Martikovs right there alongside them, that's probably going to incentivize them not to steal right in front of their faces. Area 18 and 19, we have the kitchen and dining room and the sleeping quarters. Pretty standard stuff here. Once again, extremely well furnished and makes this place feel lived in and makes it feel real. Something very important to note that can be overlooked, however, is in the sleeping quarters here, we have a very interesting item. One of the toys seems to resemble a child's wooden rocking horse, except that the horse is black with wild eyes and has painted orange flames where its main tail and hooves should be. Carved into the wooden nightmare is the name Bocephalus, and in smaller lettering, the slogan is no fun, is no blinsky. So for those of you that haven't read on yet, Bocephalus is in fact a nightmare which Strahd possesses. This nightmarish horse is totally awesome and looks rad. Look at the art, incredible stuff. And it's actually interesting because this paints the picture that Blinsky actually knows of Bocephalus. We don't get any information anywhere in this book as to how many people actually know of Bocephalus. We don't get any information about how Blinsky would not only know of Bocephalus, but actually even know its name. We don't get any of that. So that is sort of interesting. If your players find this item here, and then later on they see that Strahd has this creature, they may go ahead and talk to Blinsky and say, hey, how do you know about this? You obviously know more than meets the eye. So you're going to have to question yourself, how does Blinsky actually know about this thing? And to that degree, maybe you could go ahead and say that someone told him about it. Maybe that special someone was actually Vasily von Holtz and he decided to go ahead and play along. You know, that would certainly be fun. However, a far more reasonable understanding as to why Blinsky knows about Bocephalus is because Rictavio told him about it. Rictavio is a storyteller and he appears to be friends with Blinsky, so that would make sense. And lastly here we have Area 20, the printing press. This place, of course, has a little contraption, and if your players were super sneaky and stealthy, they may go ahead and discover a druid and some vine blights in here. But if they caused a racket, then the druids and vine blights would, of course, be reinforcements elsewhere. So just like that, we're already over the locations of the winery, but something I want to go over is the druids' tactics. 
You see, if your players come in here and cause a huge hole racket, then unfortunately this could spell disaster. If all of the druids and all of the vine blights and twig blights and whatever else start pouring on the top of the players, if they are low level, they are going to lose. There is a ton of moving pieces to this environment. You have multiple spellcasters, you have dozens of creatures, and of course the verticality of this place is going to be somewhat confusing at times. So you need to take into consideration all these factors. Now druids natively by themselves are not that tough. They do have a higher AC if they cast bark skin on themselves. Their HP pool is pretty decent. They can withstand a few hits. But really the big issue is, is that they can go ahead and pour out some free damage if you have them doing thunder wave. They can go ahead and disrupt the environment if they use entangle. And they of course have some cantrips which they can go ahead and always be throwing. The big issue in the fight isn't the druids here, it's the numbers. It's the fact that there's all those vine blights, all those twig blights that can constantly be wearing down your player's resources. So once again, if you have creative players, they go ahead and sneak in here and they take out the druids one by one stealthfully, then it's not going to be that big of an issue. They can go ahead and deal with it no problem. But if they generate some noise, they're going to have all everything coming down on top of them. They're going to have to get creative. They are probably going to have to try and hold up into a certain area and take out the enemies one by one. This could be just one big old bash, or it could be a super prolonged siege that climbs up and down with multiple druids all over the place. I would strongly recommend not having the druids simply throw themselves out against the party willy-nilly. I would have the druids ordering their little minions to go ahead and attack, and once all the blights are dead, they go ahead and finish the job. They are not stupid. They're going to use those blights to their own advantage. So, of course, if you have a higher level party, this isn't that big of a deal. If you have a level 5, 6, 7 group, then they're going to start tearing through this place absolutely no issue. But if you have a lower level group, level 2, 3, 4, they show up here, then it's going to be a big deal. What I personally would recommend is if your players come in here and they're lower level and they're having a rough time, if any of the druids are killed, Maybe the others retreat except for the one with the ghoul thia staff. The one with the ghoul thia staff then goes ahead and accidentally exposes himself. Your players can get the drop on him and then take that ghoul thia staff for themselves. Of course, your players don't have to be alone in this whole endeavor. As I mentioned before, one of the Martikovs, or maybe even more of the Martikovs, join your players in this assault here so your players have some companions by their side. And mind you, those Martikovs being were ravens, they're not going to be taking damage from the everyday normal stuff. They are in fact only going to get damaged by magical effects. And as I alluded to earlier, if some of the Martikovs are alongside the players during this assault, then hopefully they don't get any sticky fingers. And if a couple of were ravens on their side isn't good enough, they also have these swarm of ravens. The swarm of ravens are going to help out destroying those twig blights, but then they can go ahead and start turning on the druids. If you have a druid up there that's casting produce flame left and right and entangling everyone, then having a few swarms go ahead and literally swarm the thing can help out your players. Maybe it does attack, but maybe it goes ahead and uses the help action and then your players get the advantage. This little dungeon crawl here works extremely well no matter what level party you have because it can just be one big ol' epic combat or it could be a prolonged engagement with multiple you know, skirmishes, which could be a blast. Of course, if you have a higher level party and you have a couple of spellcasters, they may go ahead and cast some very disruptive spells, in which case that could destroy the environment, and you do have to consider the ramifications of that action. So after the druids are routed or killed, your players can then go ahead and make their way back to the Martikovs. Once again, your players are going to have to find a way to deal with those blights outside, whether they go ahead and just snap the Gulthia staff right there, or they come up with some creative way to go ahead and destroy them, that's entirely up to them and then they can go ahead and secure the place for the Martikovs to return. Davian's going to go ahead and say, hey, thank you so much for helping me. I'll go ahead and gather whatever wine is left, and we can go ahead and deliver it out. Davian is going to ask them to go ahead and escort the wine back to town, and it states here that if the characters escort the wagon, check for a random encounter once every mile, and the wagon is also watched over by swarms of ravens that swoop down and attack anything that threatens the wagon or the characters, which is nice. On average, a random encounter won't happen because on a d20 at the roll high, but you know, that could be interesting because if an encounter does happen and your players know that they need that wine to get back to whatever town or location that they need it to, then they are going to be fighting hard to protect it. And sometimes an escort mission can be fun. 
But of course, this whole engagement and how your players interact with the Martikovs and more importantly, their dwelling is going to tell the Martikovs if they are a good group of people or not. If your players are a good group of people, then Davian's going to confide in them and say, hey, we're missing some gens and we need you. We need you to go ahead and get them back. He's going to say, hey, we know for a fact that the druids stole one of the gems and made their way over to Yester Hill down south and we need you to go ahead and get it back. And Davian is also going to mention that he believes a gem was stolen by Baba Lysaga, but would he know exactly where she is? Maybe, maybe not. They are ravens that can fly around, so it does make sense, you know, that they do have eyes everywhere. So maybe he can go ahead and say that, oh, we know for a fact she's somewhere around Berez, and that can prompt your players to go there. But here's the thing. If your players are not good aligned people, they're scumbags, then Davian's not going to really trust them because they are scumbags, right? So if they are a scumbag group and Davian does not confide in them, or if your players are good aligned but they say that they have business elsewhere and don't have time to go to Yester Hill, then unfortunately for them, the winery is screwed. If and when the characters ever return to this location after departing, they are going to arrive to grapevines trampled and the winery in ruins. Winter Splinter's tracks are clearly visible on the trail to the south. Characters who follow the tracks catch up to the Winter Splinter as the blight slowly makes its way back to Yester Hill. So of course this is a whole other chapter's detail here, chapter 14. But essentially the druids are taking that gem and they're going to slap it into a tree. And that tree is going to come to life and it's going to destroy the winery and make life miserable. Thankfully, the Martikovs are not caught up in the destruction. They go ahead and bounce as soon as they see that tree coming. And all of the Martikov family makes their way over to Velaki, where they now reside in the Blue Water Inn. Of course, this is the worst timeline, because if the winery is destroyed, the gem's not recovered, then that does infer that slowly over time in the lands of Barovia, no more wine production. Everyone gets miserable. Everyone gets suppressed. Morale is at an all-time low. Three days after Winter Splinter's attack... Baba Lysaga orders some scarecrows to go ahead and maintain a position here to discourage anyone from ever recovering the winery ever again. So unfortunately we don't get an actual timeline on how long it would take for every town to run out of wine and we don't get any information about what actually happens mechanically if anything happens if there's no more wine. But I would go ahead and say that if wine production stops in the lands of Barovia then you should go ahead and do something. You should make it clearly present that life is absolutely miserable here. Maybe you make it so the commoners don't even consider working with a party anymore because they just don't see any point in ever doing anything ever now. If you want to get really depressing, you could have it where people are killing themselves or maybe just not ever doing anything anymore. Maybe they just don't go outside. Maybe they don't do something. But if you should make it clearly present that... If there is no wine in the lands of Barovia, then there should be some consequences because these people's lives suck. They need something to cope with it. And just like that, we are done with the Wizard of Wine's winery. Chapter 12. Once again, the whole erratic nature of this campaign means that that chapter number is completely irrelevant. This thing is a huge sandbox and the chapter numbers don't make any sense in any semblance whatsoever. The winery is a location which can be played at at multiple different levels and it's very easy to go ahead and scale accordingly. It is a pretty awesome location and once again depending on the level that your players show up here it is an entirely different experience and that's okay. So go ahead and tell me how do you plan on running the Wizard of Wines winery? Are you going to have it where everyone in all of Barovia is saying hey we need that wine go ahead and check out that wine and that's going to drive the people there? Or are you going to have it where people are just going to offhandedly mention that, that there is a Wizard of Wines winery? And maybe that is enough to prompt your players to go ahead and explore it. How are you going to handle the druids? Are they going to be as combative as can be? Or are they going to be standoffish and not want to deal with anything? And something very important to note about this whole campaign is we know the location of two of the gems. We know that one of them is at Yester Hill in Winter Splinter. And we know another is in Baba Lysaga's Creeping Hut. But the third one, the Champagne du la Stamp, that is not located anywhere in the book. It's entirely left up to you. Maybe you have it located somewhere in the world. Maybe it's located in a location that you want your players to explore. That right there can be a font of great adventure. And I know for a fact that I'm going to be doing a special video on that, so stay tuned for that.
That is going to do it for me for this one. Thank you so much for watching. And thank you to all my lovely patrons up here. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. That is going to do it for me. Thank you so much for listening. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.